Okay, we're going to continue our discussion on the book of Acts. Uh, we've been talking about the first portion, not moving quite as fast as I would desire. I never do, it seems like. Uh, I always have intentions to, it's sort of like when I write my books, I always have intentions to hit deadlines and I never do. And I suppose it's the same with the class. So we just keep moving, persevering, and accomplishing it. But uh, we have at least moved to this point to uh, chapter 5. We've been talking something about Ananias and Sapphira just a moment. And we will finish chapter 5 and start 6. I really would like it if tonight we could at least approach, <laughs> you know, chapter 12. Maybe we won't make it there, but uh, at least through Cornelius, I hope. But I hate to just, you know, push things that sometimes need some discussion, so I don't know. Um, I want to point out a, a two or three books to you, besides what you have. Uh, one is a very fine book. Now, I don't know if you can get this. Hopefully you can. <clears throat> it's a little pricey, but written by Colin Hammer called The Book of Acts and the Setting of Hellenistic History. And unfortunately, uh, he uh, died before he was able to complete every single thing in here, but people took his notes, which apparently were very well done, and completed it. And he had a whole uh, series planned similar to this on the Book of Acts. He was a classical scholar, and uh, he never did get to write them. I'm always concerned about that with my books. I have my four-volume systematic I can't afford to be killed in an airplane crash because I've got to finish it. It's that kind of thing. I guess when you die, though, you don't have to, do you? <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> but uh, Colin Hammer, The Book of Acts and the Setting of Hellenistic History, a very fine book. Again, it, uh, I don't know how much this is, but I'm sure it's 40 or $50. It's a fairly pricey book, but extremely good. Another book is written by my uh, thesis advisor prior to his death. All these people dying I'm showing you here. Uh, Martin, Martin Charlemagne was my thesis advisor at uh, Concordia Seminary St. Louis. He died uh, while I was there, and I changed to another thesis advisor, Armin Mollering. But this was his dissertation, uh, Dr. Charlemagne, called Stephen a Secular Saint. I, see, I don't mean secular, singular, I mean singular saint. And uh, this is his work on uh, Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7 and the first portion of chapter uh, 8. <clears throat> I wouldn't be full in agreement with him on everything, but nonetheless, I found his work to be very quite interesting. So uh, this you don't have usually this kind of study on Stephen, but that's a very good work. Now, the third thing is something you can buy. It's not in print, but you can buy it because uh, there's a, uh, a friend of mine who has a book... What I call it? It's not really a book house. It's he, he is, his house is full of books, <laughs> but he uh, sells books to people uh, by long distance. You know, he has a he's called Good Books uh, on the internet, and uh, not only does he offer used books and new books, but also he offers reprints because what he does, he has uh, gotten a good master of these things, and he goes down ever so often, and makes a bunch of copies and has them bound. And I have a number of books from him like that that are just unreachable. You know, you can't get them. And this is, you know, a fairly good price. This is $40. That's, that's a good price. This book is, uh, considering the fact it's, you know, two pages per page. <laughs> uh, this right here is, uh, six, let's see, about 650 pages. Okay. <clears throat> and what this book is, is as you go through the Bible, and deal with various biblical texts, the author, whose name was Milligan, Thomas Milligan, he, uh, he, what he, it's, a subtitle is called, well, let me just give you the title, The Testimony of the Heathen to the Truths of Holy Writ, a commentary on the Old and New Testaments compiled almost exclusively from Greek and Latin authors of the classical ages of antiquity. So what he's done, every place there's anything in the Bible that has any relationship whatsoever to what is found in Greek and Latin antiquity, he puts it in here. Now, that, first of all, means that you're familiar with Greek and Latin antiquity. Uh, it's a phenomenal task. You know, you, uh, you would have to have read a lot in the Greek and Latin 
uh, authors of the period, the Roman period, the Greek period, you know, let's say from the uh, earliest Greek periods all the way through the Roman, uh, let's say, uh, 5th or 6th century A.D. through the Roman period up to the time of, you know, Christ and afterwards, you have had to read a lot and then try to remember where you read certain things and go look them up that relate to particular biblical passages. Because it's not like we have now, If I, what I could do is find something in the New Testament and do a search on my computer and see if I could find a similar phrase or something. They didn't have computers in these days. This was written in... Oh boy. <clears throat> it's in Latin. Uh, the uh, Roman numerals, let's see here. Boy, uh, MDCCCLX111. Yeah, I'm just that's uh, I know that's 63. It's probably uh, 1863. That sounds about right. Does that make sense to you? MDCCCLX111. It's probably 1863. So. Uh, they obviously did not have those kind of tools to work with. Well, that's a pretty phenomenal work. Uh, let me give you an example here uh, where it says uh, in, in the book of Acts, Acts 5, verse 39, And if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply you be found even to fight against God. That's a biblical text. So then he gives a statement out of Euripides, Epictetus, and Plutarch. Uh, out of Euripides, the quote is, Ceasing to strive with the deity who is more powerful than you are, you have considered what is good and useful. And Epictetus, To desire impossibilities is base and foolish. It is behavior of a stranger to the world, of one who fights against God, the only, one, the only way he can by his principles. And last, out of Plutarch, You see, it is impossible to do anything against the will of God. So he finds comparisons in the ancient world to what you find in the New Testament text and the Old Testament text and puts it in here. So it's really quite an interesting work. Uh, you can find even probably sermon illustrations out of this. <clears throat> but uh, that's $40. It's well worth it. I also have another one just like it, except it's, uh, it's a little harder to work with because every single thing, it's a th little thicker book, uh, but everything is in Greek and Latin, and so I had to take time to translate it. But... Uh, this right here is in English. <clears throat> okay. Any questions from last night that I confuse anybody on any subject? PJ. Uh, we all okay? Uh, let me point out something to you about the new handout. I picked this out of, uh, I think it's called Irvin Larson, or no, Irvin Jensen, his uh, work. And he does some really good things like this, and it helps us to view the book a little more thematically and synthetically. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, I'll follow his uh, particular, you know, he has AD 30 to 61, and we can vary whether we think it is uh, another date or not. <clears throat> but uh, if you'll notice how he how he makes it, so you can sort of remember the the uh, what's in each each chapter. Chapter one taken up. Guess who's just talking about the ascension of Christ? Obviously, Holy Spirit coming, the gate called beautiful. What what happened there? Yeah. The healing of the lame man, right? In ward. Now I don't know what that means. I miss. I can't figure out what that's saying. I'd have to look in chapter four and figure out what he's saying. I'd probably find something else. Uh, it could be you have the uh, you have the jailing of Peter and John. They're arrested. So you think of a ward, maybe a guardian or a guard. So maybe he's saying under guard, something like that. That might be it. But we don't usually use that terminology today. You'd say in prison or something of the sort. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, chapter 5, 6 widows, 7 Stephen. See, if you can just remember the basic idea, 
at the top there, you can think your way through the book of Acts. Does that help? This is really a helpful way to do it. Uh, it used to be a practice of mine that I even required students to, uh, to work this way uh, through a book, and it, it will help you work it. Now, if you'll notice, those are the major themes. Then, in broader terms, the church is born, the first two chapters. The church goes through testing, chapters 3 through 7. The church is scattered. That's after the persecution and death of Stephen. That's chapter 8, 1b through 9, essentially 931. The church embraces the Gentiles, starts in 932 and goes through 12. The church extends overseas, chapters 13 through 21, 1 or 17, I guess. And the church is leader on trial, 21, 18 following. Well, that gives you the, essentially the whole movement of the book of Acts. And then, of course, he puts dates and then individuals that are important to the period. Uh, locations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. We already talked about that one. A Jewish period versus transitional period versus Gentile period. Major people, Peter is the first 12 chapters. Paul, the remaining thir uh, chapters. Peter is uh, most important for the first uh, seven chapters. Shares the spotlight in the next few chapters. And finally, Paul is the scene. Now, why is Paul the major person in 13 on? Anybody can tell me why this so? Because it's the Gentile world. Gentile world, correct. And uh, Paul, obviously, at this point, has uh, gotten his head screwed on straight. He's ready to move. And then it's not hardly any time until he picks up Barnabas, uh, Barnabas for sure. And then Luke, and the rest of the rest of the book. Uh, church established, church scattered, and church extended, Gentile period, and so forth. So this is how he breaks down the book, and it will help you think it through. Okay, so uh, we'll be looking at that from time to time. I'm sorry. Oh, there are other copies right over here. Uh, let me get it for you. Oh, can you get it? Thank you. Now, if you look on the uh, the wall, the perspective of Acts 8 through 12, we'll be looking at that in a few minutes. But first of all, notice 1 through 7, we have the content and impact of the message. When we move to 8, we're going to move to the impact of the message on individual lives. So here we are, first of all then, in, uh, in 1 through 7. So let's continue on and see this is the foundation for the book setting forth the content of the message of Christ and the impact on that message. We see repeatedly that there is a considerable uh, impact or considerable activity that occurs after the preaching of the gospel. Several thousand coming to Christ. We know of at least 5,000 or more, uh, and there probably were quite a few more than that. I doubt if this is every single mention. It's just like the gospels. Uh, not everything is said in the Gospels that could be said. Christ did more than the Gospels talk about. I suspect if you were to actually just compact it in time, you could probably take everything Christ did and finish it in two weeks. <laughs> you know, it, it's, 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 not a, it's, it's, it's a very uh, selective mentioning of things that happen. Uh, if you've ever walked in Israel or ever driven, I actually never walked the length of Israel. I've driven it a few times. But it doesn't take long. You can start up at the top of Israel in the Golan area, close to Syria, drive down to the tip in your lot, and probably make it about three hours. That's the. And if you want to drive across it, and I'm including the West Bank because that's actually the Jewish homeland, also, despite the uh, Muslim Arabs who want it. The um, the width is about 40 miles. So you're not talking about a big place. That's why when you when you talk about 21 Arab states and they need one more to make 22, then you cut the width of Israel to 10 miles at many places. Very, very indefensible military. Terrible, terrible situation. Uh, so that's why they're fighting so much to preserve themselves. Um, most people don't realize it's that small. And the Arab lands make up 300 times that size. And they've got plenty of land and no people on it. So, uh, just a little, my, I, I'm being paid by Zionists out of Israel for making my uh, commercials, so I want to be sure and get them in. Now, I feel strongly about that. I think it's an atro atrocity. Now, 
uh, we're continuing on then, we, we find that the apostles uh, confronted the same people that put Christ to death. And they thought they could sort of take these people, after all they were ignorant fishermen, but most of them, and intimidate them. And they weren't very successful. Then they beat them and told them not to preach in Christ's name again. Of course, this did not have a, a major impact. You have to decide who you're going to serve in life, either God or yourself. And they said, is it better to please God or man? It's interesting, even Socrates said something very similar to this. Uh, that he would not stop proclaiming what he understood to be true in spite of their intimidation and threat of death. So people of principle uh, don't surrender in times like this. And uh, let me tell you something. You do not develop principle at a moment. Principle is something that, and character is something that grows over a period. Uh, so here you have Gamaliel. Now, who is Gamaliel? Anybody have an idea? Paul's mentor. Paul's mentor. Gamaliel was a very important rabbi of the first century A.D. Uh, was the teacher of the Apostle Paul. When it says that, he, that Paul sat at his feet, may very well mean that he was uh, somewhat of a prized pupil of Gamaliel. And Paul is brilliant enough that he may have, in fact, become the next rabbi. And so if it had not been for Paul being converted, we'd probably be reading... A Jewish history and all of a sudden you have a guy called Saul of Tarsus who was the famous rabbi from Jerusalem we all heard of him right and then the uh, Jewish uh, scholars today would be looking back in fondness on Paul instead of as they think him to be the beginner of Christianity I don't know if you know but Jewish scholars view that Jesus was in fact uh, a rabbi who essentially followed the thinking of the rabbis of the time by the way, there was a diversity of opinion among the rabbis. There were many rabbis that thought that there were Pharisees who were no good and other Pharisees who were good. And that's really the case. Not all the Pharisees were bad people. Um, and there are many rabbis and, and, and the Pharisees and scribes and so forth who, who looked at uh, Judaism at the time and thought it needed reforming. It's not, you know, it's not unique to Jesus. But uh, they, would, uh, they would probably look and say Jesus then was a, a rabbi who sided with the Pharisees, usually, in theology. And um, it's Paul who changed things. Paul began a new religion that Jesus never envisioned. Jesus was a Jew within Judaism. Paul, because of his Hellenistic influence out of Tarsus, begin to form a new religious thought. And though we won't have time to go into it in any depth, when you read Stephen in the sermon, remember Stephen was a Hellenistic Jew, not a Judean Jew. That's important to recognize. Because Stephen uh, basically de-emphasizes, if not uh, minimizes, the importance of the temple, which no Judean Jew would probably ever do. And many people believe that Paul was influenced somewhat in his theology by hearing Stephen's sermon. And you'll find many points of commonality between Stephen's arguments and Paul's arguments. So there's some things there that are very interesting to, to look at. Uh, but you have this this man by the name of Gamaliel, as I mentioned before, teacher of Paul, fairly broad-minded kind of rabbi. Uh, so we have the fact that after they had kicked the apostles out, Peter and John, not all the apostles, and had told them to be quiet or they're going to get more of the same, they went right out and started preaching again, which infuriated these people. Their authority is being challenged. Remember, the reason why the Sadducees and the priests, and the priests were mainly from the Sadducees there, the reason why they were upset with Jesus was not because he was a religious teacher. There were many religious teachers of the day. There were lots of rabbis. 
don't know if you know this. There were lots of people like Jesus who were rabbis, teachers. That's what rabbi is, rabbi, teacher. Who were walking around Judea and Samaria, who had a group of disciples roaming around them, teaching. There, were more than, there was more than one theological seminary in Judea, Samaria, and the Galilee. Jesus had one. John had an earlier one. And there were competing seminaries in the days of Jesus. Now, I'm using seminary. That seems odd. But remember, they were seminaries without walls. They had the best audiovisual in the world. They didn't have to do this. Jesus walked out and says, see over here? When he said, a city is, that is set on a hill cannot be hid, you know where he said that? He said that around the Sea of Galilee, and all you had to do is look up at Mount uh, uh, Arbel, and on the, top of, on the top of Mount Arbel is a city. And he says, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. See what I mean? Look. <laughs> and we, we forget that. We read these things, and we forget where these things are being said, but when you and I've been on the top of Mount Arbel, it's high. It's uh, I don't like to get close to the edge of these things. I have a little problem with that. But you got this gigantic, and and so uh, they were a traveling seminary, and the same thing that there were other people doing the same thing. And of course, Paul was in a seminary too, the seminary of Gamaliel. Except the seminary of Gamaliel would be in the day viewed as the Harvard and Yale, Cambridge or Oxford. The seminary of Jesus would be considered a maybe faith seminary or some other seminary this small. Uh, he, uh, he was just building his reputation, so to speak. He was not a major player at this point. How long was his teaching? He only taught for three years. He just barely got going. Hadn't even got accreditation yet. Now, I'm being facetious with you a little bit, but I'm not in another way. The issue of reputation. Christ had barely been on the scene. Who are you? Oh, you're a carpenter, son? Oh, you don't have the right pedigree. You know, who trained you? You don't, who trained you? Uh, and then, of course, Christ told him, well, uh, let's see, let's see. I'm trained, uh, I'm God, you know, so I don't need that kind of training. And that posed problems. But... Uh, you have to sort of see this in the light of the time and what you're encountering. And there were other people walking around doing teaching too. And Christ was under suspicion. He, I remember when uh, Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus at night time. By the way, that's significant in the Greek. There, that it's a night time of coming. That is, he did not want to come during the daytime because he, people would have seen him. But he came at night to Jesus. And he said, we, we who? You read the text, he represented the, the, uh, the Sanhedrin. And he was a Pharisee in the Sanhedrin. We know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can speak the things as you have said except God be with him. So Jesus is beginning to get his reputation. And what Nicodemus is offering to him basically is an opportunity to join the local association of rabbis, you know, the ministerial alliance. And Jesus' rewards were to him, were very clear. Well, thank you very much. Now, Jesus' first words to him were, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Or actually, I would translate it, you must be born from above. Again, it's not the best translation. Uh, nor is a new. Above is really the best translation there, I'm a thin. You must be born from above. And Nicodemus says, huh? <laughs> I just gave you an invitation to join the local association. Now you're asking me if I'm about being born from above? What are you talking about? So you have to see these things within that context. There were all sorts of... Gamaliel was one of these. Now, when they heard this about these disciples, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Now we've got a Jesus problem, see? Why were they after the disciples? For the same reason they were after Jesus. Jesus impacted their political power and their wealth. Now their wealth was directly connected to their political power. If they were dispossessed by Rome, they ceased to be rich people. They were using their position for, for wealth. Now that doesn't occur today at all, but in these days it did. It's amazing how many people who start in political office who after they finish political office are wealthier than they used to be. I'm not sure how that happens, you know. 
But anyway, this one in the council stood up, then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. We're going to have a, uh, a, a session in camera, as they say in law. Okay? Now, and he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis arose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this, is, if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, this seems a regular pattern, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for shame for his name. i got to admit, when I read that, it gives me a little conviction. I suspect if I had been beaten and kicked out of the door, I'd been, I'd been saying, you know, who do these guys think they are, a bunch of idiots? How dare they touch us and do that? We're going to sue. You know, I mean, you know <laughs> they would have said that, obviously. But, you know, it's that kind of, I would be looking at recrimination. And they leave saying, man, wasn't it wonderful that we got to suffer for Christ's sake? I, I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm not an apostle. No, that's not the only reason. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the important happening in chapter 5. What we have here then is the uh, basic testing of the church, as you see in your outline I've given you. See, we've now moved through what is called the testing. Uh, I, I, we haven't finished it, but we're moving through that in the area of the testing. Now, chapter 6. In chapter 6, we move to uh, the organization of the church. And I don't know whether you want to call these people that are chosen here to be deacons, or whether you want to say that they, they are sort of the precursors to deacons. That is, they were chosen to serve in a particular function that later found its way into the church, in a more formal structure, and that's probably the case. Uh, I doubt if they, were, when they established these seven people, if they were thinking about a permanent office. They were thinking about dealing with a temporary problem, but it became such an obvious kind of function. Now, let me say, one of the reasons why it's an obvious function is because this particular function was also practiced in the Jewish synagogue. Much of what we observe in the organization of the New Testament church is uh, patterned after the way in which the Jewish synagogue was, was uh, structured. So, and it may be that even the apostles, as they chose to do these deacons, even if they didn't consider them permanent, saw a model in what they had experienced already. Oftentimes we make decisions based on our own experiences. So, you know, you can, you can make your own determination of that. Uh, but what happens is based on what I said last session, last time we met, is that you have a lot of people from the diaspora, the dispersion, who came from all these places like Fergie and Pontus and and uh, and Serene and and, uh, and other places throughout the world, Babylonia, wherever they came from, uh, coming to Jerusalem, and then they wanted to stick around. Why well, leave? If we leave, we don't have anybody to teach us. If we leave, we don't have people of like mind. 
Uh, they really weren't viewing evangelism here. They weren't thinking, man, if we get out of here and go back home, we can start preaching Jesus. That wasn't what their thoughts were. But you know, let me say something about that. I'm not sure it's wise to ever disperse prior to receiving training. People can have all sorts of zeal, and they're to be commended for zeal, but zeal without knowledge destroys people. I know an individual I was counseling a while back about going to school, and he's just so eager to go to the mission field. He says, I'm older now, and I need to get to the mission field. The time is passing. You know, I, I'm a, he said to me, he said, I'm concerned the Lord's going to come, and I'm not even going to get there. I'm going to say, if that happens, don't worry about it. You know, it'll be okay. <laughs> the point of it is, it's important to receive training uh, before you do the work. And zeal unbridled and untrained oftentimes leads to destruction destroying other people as well as yourself so uh, each of you know now receiving training in school uh, the importance of it but a lot of people don't and and I appreciate their enthusiasm you hope they can just maintain it but you need the training and so the reason I say that is that it, there's something to be said about these people who came to Jerusalem being around the apostles to receive the commandments of Christ, to receive the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, strengthening, and so forth. Having said that, there will be a time, though, and maybe they didn't know the timing. As true with me sometimes, I don't know the timing either. You know, when should I do this or that? Well, just stick around, keep following the Lord, and He will eventually, at His own timing, uh, put you where you ought to be. I'm convinced of it. We're going to find that we have a dispersion here again in a few minutes uh, when we look at the what happened after Stephen and Paul breathing threatenings against the church. Uh, little did, you know, I mean, Paul hadn't planned this. The church hadn't planned it. God had it planned. And so there was going to be an opportunity to uh, to do the preaching that they needed to do, but only after it was God's time for them to, to be scattered after they received the necessary tra training and, and support. So look at verse 6. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, and we know that there are how many? Thousands. A complaint against the Hebrews there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now you may wonder about this term Hebrews. So we, we today always say the word Jew. And the word Jew is certainly a legitimate term, but Jew is a more narrow term than Hebrew. Abraham, in some respects, his progeny, as they found themselves in Egypt, were probably Hebrews, right? So that name started early. And there's some debate where that term came from. But at this juncture, Hebrews was more specifically a title for Jews who were in the Holy Land and Hellenist in, in referring to those that were uh, outside the Holy Land. 